Right. I, it, I, preacher didn't say anything about any announcements, but I, anything going on that needs to be said. Uh, I know Friday night at West Connect, at 7 o'clock, I think it is, it starts. Huh? Well, it's not this Friday, it's fr following Friday. Well, I'm glad I said that because I'd have showed up Friday night. Amen. <laughs> All right, this Friday night for that, okay. All right, and what time is Friday night? Seven? Okay. All right, anything else? Any other announcements that need to be made? Yes, Brother Bill? Uh-huh. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. Alrighty. I was just wondering if you may have had an update on Brother Rodney and uh, Sister Robbie. I haven't been able to go for a couple of days. I haven't had a couple of hours. Robbie's there. Robbie's there now. Actually, Brother Rodney, um, yesterday was, was pretty bad. Uh, today he seemed to be doing a little bit better. They're changing his medicine around. If I'm correct, trying to get him on a level that's going to be good for him. Um, Sister Rhonda McSwain was sitting with her this afternoon, with Bobby this afternoon. Um, there was food carried in today, enough for tomorrow. Um, we need to um, do volunteer service to help Sister Bobby. Uh, of course, her arm is still in the cast. Um, the family is trying to do as much as they can. They're all on their whole jobs, and it's very hard. They, uh, they need someone to the day to sit with her and through the night to sit with her. So if you have time that you can spend there, it'll be well spent. Um, you've not been blessed until you go into that home and see. Just like both of them are going through. Um, Rodney's spirits are pretty much down right now. Um, and uh, we need to lift him up, both spiritually, and he likes to be prepared. Um, Sister Bobby is a blessing just for you to go in and just sit with him while she can just go to the Yeah. without worrying about him. Or she can go in and cook a meal for him without worrying about him. And so if you have extra time, it'll be well spent in that home. So please. That's right. You're not supposed to lose your babies. That's right. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's do that. Let's just stop and pray for that family. Pray for Brother Rod and his sister Bobby and all the rest of the family. And uh, ask that God meets that need. If you do have some time where you can go, uh, I don't know who to tell you to see. See Sister Ann. I'll volunteer her. But, uh, all right. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Keith, uh, how about praying uh, for that family for us, please?
Amen. All right. Turn with me tonight, if you would, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 30. 1 Samuel 30. Uh, it's good to be back home. I uh, had a, in, enjoyed being away a couple of weeks. Thank you. Some of you called while called me while I was away to check to see how I was doing, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much, and many of you have said to me, it's good to see me back. It's good to be back. And uh, I, I, I accomplished what I went to do, and that wasn't very hard because I went to do nothing, okay? <laughs> Pretty well got it accomplished. Amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but... Uh, I, I really, I, I really needed to get away, and I didn't know I needed to go until I left. I didn't know I needed to go as bad as I did uh, until I got away. And uh, but I, I was able to spend some time with a preacher friend of mine, and spent about four or five days with him at his house, and was able to preach for him at his church, and then uh, stayed a week with my brother and saw my grandkids and. Uh, uh, one of my uh, sons and uh, just had a, the Lord just blessed, had a great time. It's good to be home. And uh, so thank you for praying for me and concerned about me while I was gone. All right. Uh, tonight, First Samuel chapter number 30 and verse number 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and, and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, uh, Hinoam, the Jezreelitist, and uh, Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord. And saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. All right, we'll stop reading at, uh, at verse 8 tonight. We're going to look at some other things that tie in to this. This is a, it's just one of those chapters that is just a action-packed chapter. I mean, there's things going on. And, uh, and, and they're big things, not just little everyday occurrences. In the previous chapter, if you were to go back and read that, you'd find that David... Um, uh, is once again back among the Philistines. He's back among King Achish, uh, only this time 
we find that he has, in some manner, in some way, he's befriended the king of the Philistines here. Now remember that Goliath was a Philistine. Uh, and, and, and they are some of those folk who hadn't forgot that. And so, uh, but he's back and he's among these people. Now, when you find him in chapter 29, it's a far cry from the last time that you find him among the Philistines, back in chapter 21, uh, where David found himself so much in danger of being killed, the Bible says that he feigned uh, himself mad. He acted like a madman. Uh, uh, the Bible describes him as just slobbering all over himself and 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 scratching at the at the door and 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 just acting like a uh, like a mad person would a crazy person and in, in fact uh, the when he did that there were some people there that wanted to kill him and they 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 told King Achish about him. And told the king what he was doing, and he said, Listen, uh, let me just paraphrase it for you. I've got enough crazy people in my kingdom. I don't need another one. Get rid of him. <laughs> so they didn't kill him, they run him off. You can't tell me that wasn't of God. Amen. I mean, that's of the Lord that that happened to him, that his life was even spared. However, when we come to uh, this part of the uh, of the book, when we get to chapter 29, something has happened. We don't, I, I really don't know what happened. But something happened that David is now an ally with this Philistine king. He's taken his, by this time he has 600 men, and he's taken these men, and he's joined up with the Philistine army. And, uh, and they are about to go to war against Saul, against Israel. And, and, and David has made an alliance with them. And at the last minute, some of the princes of the Philistines said, listen, we don't trust this guy. Don't they, and so they tell the king, don't let him come with us. It, what's going to happen is when we get into the heat of the battle, he's going to turn on us. And so the king was reluctant to turn David and these men away. But because of the pressure that was put on him, he did. He sent him away. Now, by this time as well, he has such a relationship with King Achish that the king has given him and his men and their families a city to dwell in. The city called Ziklag. I, 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 evidently, I don't know this for sure, but it appears to be that they were the only inhabitants. It doesn't appear that there were any Philistines living there. Uh, so, being turned away from the battle, now they, it's a three-day journey from where they are back to Ziklag, and when they get back there, of course we read the account, the city has been burned with fire. Uh, David is a man, when he sees what's happened here, this is nothing in his life, this is nothing new to him, this kind of a thing. You, if you're acquainted with his life, you know that 
he was acquainted with such things as grief and disappointment and hardships and the loss of all his possessions and even those who were supposed to be his friends, it's happened before, turned out to be against him. This is just normal everyday living for David. That's kind of normal everyday living for a lot of us, amen? Not just him. It's just normal everyday living for a lot of people. But for the last 16 months before this incident here, David has been living a relatively a good life. He's in the city. He's not living in the caves. He's not living in the woods. He's not on the run from Saul. Uh, all of his men and their families and David and his family. He's got his family there. He's got his wives there. Things have what we might would refer to as kind of return to some normality in his life. And then he returns home one day, and lo and behold, everything that he has is gone. The whole town has been burned with fire and ransacked, and nothing's left. Not only do we find that the Amalekites had been there, but when we look at verse 3, we find the destruction and the devastation that they left behind. Uh, verse 3 says, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. It was such an overwhelming uh, sight that it caused these rough, tough... We would, we, here's what we would call him and his men today. Mercenaries. Soldiers of fortune. Uh, these were the kinds of men they were at this time. And it causes these, what we would at least mentally picture in our mind, giants of men, warriors, men that you would never think about having emotions to the point to where they wept. But verse 4 says, Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. Watch this now. Until they had no more power to weep. You ever cry until you couldn't cry anymore? Sure you have. That's exactly what he's talking about there. We're talking about grown men. Soldiers of fortune, mercenaries, we're talking about warriors, we're talking about a guy that will spit in your eye and rip your head off. These are the kinds of men that this was. And, 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 and these men, as brave as they were, they didn't, they didn't go off and find them a tree somewhere or another and hide behind it and cry. This was such a devastating sight to them that every one of them began to weep openly before the others. Now, I, I, listen, men don't want other men to see them cry. But here, they done moved to a point where it didn't make any difference. There was something that happened that was so overwhelming in their life that they couldn't help it. All of us have had our days of crisis when everything around us seemed to fall apart. We've all had them. We all have them. I, 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 but I, I'm sure that none of us has, has ever faced such a devastating 
sight and as this. We've all had our days when we seem to run out of road. Uh, we, we've all had our days when, listen, we've all had our days when it just seemed like the Lord was nowhere to be found. Cry and plead and beg and squall and your throat get sore and all those kind of things happen and and you're pleading, dear God, please. You don't hear it. There ain't anything. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's ever happened to. Now. I, as I read this again, I, 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 I saw something here, and, and, and here it is. David, now this, this is talking about him, but he wasn't in the boat by himself. Everybody there was in the same boat. That everybody was affected. And so it is with us. Uh, we may look around and not see anybody else. We may look around and, and, and everybody else seems to have a smile on their face and, 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 uh, and things seem to be going well for everybody else, but and we're crying, and we can't cry anymore, and our, our hearts are aching, and God doesn't seem to, uh, seem to be interested in us. We can't uh, seem to hear from heaven. And all. No, listen, they were all in that boat. Every one of them. By the way, let me, uh, you want to know what kind of people these were? Turn back to, let me, let me find the chapter here. Turn back to chapter 22. Uh, he gives us, you're talking about a picture of who these men were. Here it is. Chapter 22 and verse number 2. And, and everyone that was in distress... And everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, what happened? They gathered themselves unto him, and the him there is David. And he became a captain over them, and there were about uh, there were with him about four hundred men. Now it's grown since that time. There's about six hundred. There's six hundred more that's in debt. There's 600 more that's discontented. There, there, there's, uh, or 200 more rather. There, there, there's 200 more now uh, that's, that's in distress. How'd you like to be captain over that bunch? Sounds like the pastor's job sometimes. I told you I like to preach when I ain't the pastor, amen? I'm trying to help him. Sounds like his job sometimes. I, I, I'll assure you there are days in his life that, all, that every person he meets, just about, maybe not everyone, but just about everyone is discontented and distressed. They've come to him. That's, that, that's the kind of men he had. I'm sure if he'd have had the opportunity to, to have picked his own army, he'd have never picked that crowd, amen? <laughs> but that's who God sent him. Sometimes we feel like Elijah, I'm the only one. When in fact, there are thousands upon multiplied thousands of other people going through the same thing we are at the very same moment. We just don't know about it. Let's look a little closer at his situation. 
Needless to say that things are not good. And uh, because not only does he have to contend now with the raid of these Amalekites. They've come in, burned down the city, taken everybody and took them away and everything that they owned. And so not only does he have to contend with that, but now, according to this passage of Scripture, his own men have turned against him. See what it says there? Verse 6, And David was greatly distressed for the people. Now who are the people? Who's there? Who's the people? His own men. That's all it is there. For the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. You know what they did? Now you think about this for a minute. David's with them. But they blamed him for everything that happened. Let me ask you, let me, let me just think a minute. Was it his fault? Did David have anything to do with it? That ain't a trick question now. No. Did it have anything to do with this situation? But they, oh, David, King David, we love you. We don't know, listen, watch this. We don't know who else to turn to, so we've come to you. We're in debt. Can you help us? We're distressed. I don't know where to turn. Can you help me? I'm so discontented and fed up with my family and with my job and with my everything else. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? Yeah, I believe we can help you. And so you love on them. And you help them and you get other folks to love on them. And you get other folks to help them. And you see them start to come out of the hole they've got. They got their self into. And you see them start to come out. And what happens? Somewhere down the line, something else happens now. It's all his fault. It, 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 listen, I'm just reading the Bible. I'm not making anything up. This ain't come out of the funny books. It's right out of the Word of God. It's a real life event that happened in the life of the man of God and the people that he was trying to help. And we see what happens. I, 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 I can imagine saying something on this order. You know what? Talking among themselves. You know what? If David had not insisted on us going off down there to help that bunch of Philistines and fight with them, then we'd have been here. And we could have protected our families and protected our city against these Amalekites. And if we hadn't have been off over there poking around where we didn't have any business, this wouldn't have happened to us. If David wasn't so bent on getting even with Saul, which he wasn't, but I can imagine them saying something like that. If he wasn't so wrapped up and enthroned and engrossed and trying to get even with Saul, then we would still have our families and our possessions. Hey guys, listen. All of this is David's fault. 
That's exactly what they said. It's all your fault, David. Every bit of it. My, my, my wife's gone. My kids are gone. Everything I owned is gone. My house is burned to the ground. And it's your fault. How'd you like to be in that situation? That, that's exactly what happened. Now, let me ask you something. Would, or, or how would, you see what they want to do? They want to stone him, right? How would stoning David have solved or settled their problems? You think about that for a moment. How, how could that have solved their problems? How, how would stoning David get their families back? How would stoning him rebuild their homes? And how would stoning him regain their possessions to them? You see, the answer is obvious. It wouldn't. They could have killed him. Paul said we were killed all the day long. They could have killed him all day long. And they would have never one time brought back one child or rebuilt one house or got back one cow. You see, their solution to the problem is crazy. Doesn't even make sense. Yet, People are doing the same thing today. When they find themselves in a crisis, what, do they, what happens? Many times, oftentimes, they look around and they begin to try to find a scapegoat of some kind and they begin to look for someone to blame. Happens in your family. Happens in your family. Some, some brother or sister gets upset with some other member of the family and yak, 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 and all this and that and the other. And first thing you know, uh, uh, they've got uh, two or three others of the family, uh, uh, other brothers, sisters, or cousins or uncles or whatever it may be, they've got them sucked into it now and, and they're, they're all yak, yak, yakking about it. What have they, what have, what have they how, how have they helped themselves? You haven't solved anything. Don't think you've created a bigger problem. That's all you, you, and that's all they were about to do. They were about to create a bigger problem than what they already had. And so their answer obviously is, is not a good one. And, and, and uh, after the, the initial shock here, we find that David is not faring any better than the rest of them. Look what it says in verse 6, And David was greatly distressed. Uh, now, uh, the Lord could have got by with just saying distressed. But he didn't. He emphasized the fact that this is not just some little minor incident in his life. Greatly, it, it gives us the sense that this distress is multiplied. And the word distressed there means this. It means to be bound up or to be closed in. It, which gives us now the idea that he has nowhere to go. Where's he going? There, there's no, this distress is upon him and there's nothing that he can do. There's no place that he can go. It's a great multiplied distress that he can't move from. This is his problem. This is what he's facing. 
we, we see a, 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 a great difference between David here and these other 600 men. While the others were looking for someone to blame, and they were looking for a way to vent their anger, uh, and we, we find out this, though. Why, why don't you rest of that verse? Verse 6, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because of the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son, for his daughter. Watch, here it is. What happens? But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I, I, and, and here's the thought, here's the thought of the message tonight. Sometimes you just have to encourage yourself. Sometimes your best friend's not going to encourage you. They're going to tell you to get over it and get a life. And, and sometimes that may be what you need to do. But maybe not all the time. That ain't what he needed. That wasn't his solution. But when, when, when every, everyone else was trying to find fault with him and, and uh, uh, he came to a, a point where he said, listen, I've just simply got to encourage myself. Uh, two words in that verse, and they don't even go together. Distressed and encouraged. But we find them in the same verse. And, they, and we find they happen to the same person. And then all of this, David said, listen, y'all... You're going to have to do what you need to do. But I'm not going that route. I, I'm going to encourage myself. I, I, I want you to take notice of, what the, of how the Word of God put this now, that David him encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You, you see... The Holy Spirit of God could have just simply said there, and David encouraged himself in God. That wouldn't have the same meaning. That's right. That, that's just talking about God in general, and that's what a lot of folks do. And that's why when a lot of folk find themselves in the same place that David found himself in right here, they can't encourage themselves because they have no relationship with God Himself. He's not the Lord, their God when it comes to that relationship. They may be saved. But when it comes to that point, of having to have that relationship when it comes to the point of having to find an answer, when it comes to a point of climbing out of the hole that you're in, when it comes to the point of getting out of the distress and relieving yourself from the stress and all the rest of it, there has to be a relationship between you and God Almighty. You remember I preached a few weeks ago on Jacob when Jacob said, I can't go home like this. And he came to that place at the brook Jabbok and he had a face-to-face -face meeting with God. Amen. And it wasn't until he had that face-to-face -face meeting with God that he walked away different. Amen. David encouraged Himself. Who else is he going to get to encourage him? Who's he going to get? There ain't nobody there. You're going to find sometimes. You just need to get by yourself, you and God, and you encourage yourself. Instead of waiting for somebody to come along and stick an air hose in your mouth and pump you up a little while. Yeah. Put another 30 pounds of air in you. Listen, we're just talking about life. We're just talking about the way people live. 
We just usually don't talk about it out in the open like this. But that's all we're talking about. We're just talking about the way people live. There's going to be times in your life when you're going, to, you're going to call Brother Buddy and you're going to get the answer machine. And you're going to call back 10 minutes later and you're going to get the answer machine. And you're going to call 20 times that day and get the answer machine. And now you don't know what in the world you're going to do. I'll tell you what you better do. You better start encouraging yourself. Amen. You better, and, and we're going to see from the Word of God here how to do that. It ain't no great mystery. But there are times in our lives when I, I, I don't care what, I, I wouldn't care what Brother David said to me and I believe I'm his friend and he's my friend and I don't, it wouldn't make any difference what he said to me. It wouldn't help me one iota. Not that he didn't mean it. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You appreciate what he said. And you don't disregard it and you don't discount it one bit. He doesn't know that it doesn't help me. There just comes a time when there can't nobody help but the Lord his God. Now, God use him. See, that's what's going on here. I, 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 I got to get through. No watch, okay. <laughs> the battery is dead again. Right? <laughs> I, but I'll do like the preacher anyhow. I'm trying to get through. I just can't, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want you to notice something, though, about this. I, I, I won't never get through this tonight, but let, let me give you a couple other thoughts, and we will be through. This was the last, uh, I'm trying to think of the word I want to use, the last trial, the very last trial that David had before he became king. All those years ago, back over there in the sheepfold, old Samuel came wandering by and Talked to Jesse and finally said, are all thy children here? And he said, no. He said, we have one left yet. And he's keeping the sheep. And he said, go get him. I'll not sit down till he comes. And they went and got David and brought him in there. Now, he wasn't no 10-year-old boy, okay? He's a young man. But they brought him in there and God spoke to Samuel and said, this is him, anoint him. And he anointed him to be king over Israel. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, about Bible history there and what happened, you know Saul reigned for 40 years. And Saul hadn't been reigning very long whenever Samuel anointed David. So we're looking back 40 years in time. And all this 40 years, by the way, 40, the number 40 in the Bible is the number for temptation and trials. And so for 40 years he's been tried. He's run for his life. He's hid in the dens and the caves and the, and the rocks and all of those things has happened to him and he's gone hither and, and, and yonder and, and back again and all those things has happened to him all this time. This is the last trial before David becomes king. Saul goes into battle the next day and he and Jonathan are killed in battle. And from here, from Ziklag, David and his men go to Hebron. And it's there at Hebron that they anoint him king once again. I, I, and I said that to say this. Sometimes the trials are long. 
And we're going to have them for years on end. But you don't ever know. Just keep fighting the battle because you don't know when the last one's going to come. What if David just said, hey, I'm tired of this. Just go ahead and throw all them rocks on me and kill me. No. You don't know, folks. We don't know. Let me show you something right quick like. Look at. uh, Look back at chapter 28 for a moment. This is Saul, the night before the battle, where he gets killed the next day, okay? I want you to notice what he does. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and has become thine enemy? You know, you know what that verse is out of? That's out of that passage of Scripture where he went to the witch of Endor. That's chapter 28, verse number 16 is where, you, where I just read from. But there, there, that, that passage is there where he has gone to the witch of Endor. Now, I, I want you to look at chapter 30 and verse number 7. And same night. And David said unto Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, uh, saying, Shall I pursue, and so forth. You see that? Two kings. He's, he, David's, David's already been anointed king, so technically he is a king. But he, he's about to become anointed again. Two men going into battle. Same night. One of them consults a witch. What do I need to do? The other one said to the priest, the high priest at this time, Bring me the ephod of God. I need some wisdom. I need to inquire of God. Now, I'm going to ask you something. You're going to face some battles tomorrow. I'm going to face some tomorrow. But who are we going to inquire of tonight? Who are we going to inquire of tomorrow? Uh, By the way, let me tell you this. Tomorrow when the battle gets here, it's too late to stop and inquire. The battle is on. The swords are slinging. The the arrows are flying. The spears are being thrown. The horses are running into battle. You see, the outcome of the battle depended somewhat on the preparation of the battle. Better be. We better be careful. And so David says, David says um, uh, to Abathar, bring me the ephod. I I need to inquire of God. I need to know something. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand all that's involved in that. That was some Old Testament things that they did. The priest put on that ephod. I don't think David put it on. I think the priest put it on and he inquired because David was was not a a priest. It's where Saul got in trouble. He took that office upon himself when he shouldn't have. But he... He inquired at the ephod, and he said to God, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? 
And the Lord spoke back immediately. And, I, and we all wish that was the way that it is today, but it, it, it's not. And it wasn't always that way there. It just happened to be in this incident. But God spoke back and He said, Pursue. Yeah, go after them. Shall I overtake them? Yeah, you're going to overtake them. And not only are you going to overtake them, and that means am I going to do battle and, 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 and kill them. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. But you're going to recover all. Saul inquired at the witch. David inquired at the priest of God, and God answered him. Now, I'll tell you something tonight. Listen. We've got something better than the ephod. I'm holding my hand right here. What do I need to do, Lord? Now I'm not saying you're gonna you're gonna ask the Lord that, and there's gonna be a you're gonna open your Bible, and there's gonna verse come out of the Word of God and answer your question for you right there. But I'm gonna tell you what: if you don't have a relationship with Him. So that when you do open it, you will not get the understanding you need if you don't have that relationship. And God guided David and, 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 and showed him what he wanted him to do. Three things. David surrendered to the will of God. God, whatever it is you want me to do, pursue or not pursue, that's me. And then he asked for divine strength. He realized that he could not do what needed to be done in his own strength. He asked God to strengthen him to do what needed to be done. And then he just simply trusted God for the results. It's all there. I'm going to tell you, and let me, let me say this in closing tonight. Listen, there's going to come some times in your life you're going to have to encourage yourself. Prayer chain ain't going to work for you. The pastor's not going to be able to help you. Your best friend is not going to help you because they don't know how either. And no matter what, what happens... It looks like you're going under. That's when you better learn to encourage yourself. And it better be in the Lord, your God. Amen. Amen. Folks, we need it. We need it. Let's bow our heads in prayer. We'll be dismissed tonight. I, I, I want you to just, there in your seat where you are, you talk with the Lord for a moment as we get ready to close and